I'm very proud to be the resident entrepreneur at the UN Foundation, and so I have my eye now on any entrepreneur I can find. And we thought it'd be really interesting to bring out some entrepreneurs and just hear about their perspectives on the issues we've been talking about today. So I'm really proud to introduce Reshma Sanji. She is the founders of Girls Who Code and a candidate for New York Public Advocate, yay public service. Tiffany Defu is the Chief Leadership Officer for Levo League. John Gersma is Executive Chairman of BAV Consulting. And leading this discussion is our good friend, Harry Smith, correspondent for the NBC Nightly News. Please welcome our friends. We have really smart, really talented, really motivated people up here who have real life experience in what our topic is for the next few minutes, and that is pathways to opportunity. And as I was dodging the monsoon outside today, coming down on the D train, I saw a car full of junior high kids. and. At all I could think about was how do we reach these children, these young people, to say there really is this amazing world out there. And the barriers that were there decades ago, there are still barriers to get over, but the insurmountable barriers of decades ago are certainly less present. So I just want to go one at a time at a time to just sort of get a feel for, is it? Is it are, are the doors open? Let's start with that. Are the doors open to, to opportunity? For most girls, let's at least start in the United States. There are a few doors that are open. So part of helping the girls on the D train is helping them to access those opportunities. And I really believe that one of the single most important things that we can do is to teach them and cultivate a mindset that will help them to know what to do when those opportunities present themselves. I have a four-year-old daughter, and this weekend I was trying to teach her how to ride a bike. And we started not by getting on the bike, but with a conversation about the fact that it's very hard to ride a bike, that sometimes it takes people a long time, and that you're gonna fall, you're gonna skin up your knee, you're gonna skin up your elbows, but that whether or not you actually learn how to ride this bike will be heavily dependent upon whether or not you're willing to get back up and try again. And she said, oh, like Sophia the First, when she you know, was trying to ride her horse Minimus and she kept falling off, I said, yes, and what did Sophia the First do? And she said she kept getting back up. Well, she learned how to ride the bike in 30 minutes. A mindset around growth and around resiliency, a mindset around agency and you being the most powerful change agent in your own journey is the single most important thing that those girls on the D train need. Um, and then it's up to the rest of us to make sure that we're opening the doors for them so they can run through them. Okay, I'm gonna follow up in a second. But Reshma, same sort of idea. Are, what's the best way to get on that pathway to opportunity? So I think, you know, for me, you know, as a daughter of political refugees, opportunities are about upward mobility, right? Pursuit of the American dream. And I focus a lot on computer science education and with Girls Who Code because it's clear where the future jobs are at, right? They're in the computing-related fields. 1.4 million jobs are going to be open, but less than 20% of women are going into those fields. In fact, computer science is the one industry we've actually had a decline. There are more women in computer science even 10 years ago than there are today, even though none of us can like live a day without our, with our, without our devices, right? So something is happening. Part of that something happening is I can still walk into Forever 21 and buy a t-shirt that says math sucks, right? We're not as a culture teaching our young women that they need to go into the computer science fields because that's where the growth is gonna be. And so I do think that there is opportunity for young women, but I still think like we're not doing enough to push them into the fields of the future to give them a voice, you know, because Again, 10 years from now, we'll have gender parity and pay equity, right, because there'll be more male engineers than there are female engineers. As a nation, we will have suffered 
because we won't be having 85, you know, percent of those who are making consumer purchases or 56 percent of our labor force actually building things that as a nation we need from an innovation perspective. And young women will have lost out on their voice. And I think for me, what I learned this, this summer with my, with my young women is that they build things that change the world, right? My young girls that are 16 years old built an algorithm to help detect whether a cancer is benign or malignant. They built an app on how to help homeless New Yorkers you know, navigate the city better, right? These are the ideas that they have. And so we have to create opportunities for them to get exposure to the fields of the future. John, your book is called The Athena Doctrine, How Women and Men Who Think Like Them Will Rule the World. Are the opportunity, is there a pathway to opportunity? Yeah, Harry, I mean, I think, building on what Tiffany and Reshma both talked about, I think one of the key parts of this are the millennials, the young men and women. Uh, we did surveys around the world. We did surveys in 13 countries, almost two-thirds of global GDP. And global youth, young men and women, have a fundamentally different appreciation of the role of women in their societies as they talk about a lot of the questions they answered, but also their dissatisfaction with the conduct of men. We had answered this, asked this question, and two-thirds of people around the world said the world would be a better place if men thought more like women, but the numbers jump up into like 80% when you talk to millennials. And what was interesting to us is we saw a double-digit generational gap on a lot of questions related to our survey between millennials, young men and women, and men over 50. But think about what's happened just electorally and what's going on in the last five or six years because of young people being in, in uh, voting and well, how they feel about all, a range of issues, you know, not the least of which is gay marriage. Yeah. It's just, this is a sea change is coming, but and you feel the sea change coming is the culture though catching up to it because you're talking about you have this great conversation with your daughter and you clearly have done an amazing job with a four-year-old child to teach her about these different things but how do you get that to spread past your apartment walls how do you get that to the girls on the d train so they can think differently well the the great thing about the girls on the D train is that they are engaged, although not creating the technology, which is what we want them to do, but they're certainly leveraging and using the technology. I'm sure they're all texting at the same time that you saw them talking to one another on the train. Lavo League is all about really elevating the careers of young women and helping them to cultivate this and using technology as a way to democratize this and to provide access to millions. And in fact, in terms of bridging the generational divide, we, we had Warren Buffett yesterday who in his quest to want to you know join the 21st century and also to add his voice to the voices that we're all here today talking about, which is how do we advance women, he decided to do two things, to join Twitter and to join Lavo League. And he talked specifically about the importance of, he didn't use the word mindset, but really addressing what he called the funhouse mirrors. So what he has observed is that often young women, women, but young women, and he invoked Catherine Graham, who um, is a legacy head at the Washington Post for you know, many years and you know, grew that organization, won a Pulitzer Prize, and still was plagued with this notion that I'm not quite sure if I belong here you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's how we're doing it. We're leveraging technology to get to them, to provide them access to people like Warren Buffett, like Sheryl Sandberg, who can send these messages, and providing them a sense of community so that they, they, can, they can make this happen. Yeah, I mean, to add to that, and, and, and I think some of the work that you've done too, I think what's different about this generation of young women is there's a sisterhood, right? 11 million women now have the power to make hiring decisions. Right. And we have to create a girls club. And what you guys are doing is really building that sense of accountability to one another. You know, I see, saw that in Girls Who Code. All of my girls, unprompted, taught another person how to computer program, whether it was their father or their sister or their friend, like they felt like, gosh, I've learned something special. I have to pass it on. I see this in my candidacy for public advocate. A majority of my donor base are women. A majority of my volunteer base are young women. They show up you know, by the dozens in my office because they wanna run for office one day, right? And they wanna learn how to do that. Or they're excited to see someone who looks like them 
you know, running. And, you know, they're my first thousand followers on, my, on, on Twitter or Facebook. So there's this powerful sense, I think, of community. And, you know, I call them like my impatient don't wait in line generation, <laughs> right? They're confident as anything. They are not afraid of anything. They want to be everything, right? And so that's what I feel like we have to really nourish and flourish. Um, I think that's our job as, as, as leaders in really pushing that. And one of the most important ways to do that is what you're doing, which is being that, right? Because they're all watching us and they're all looking. And part of what you just described, it's funny, Reshma is a dear friend of mine, is that you were describing them, but that's you, right? <laughs> so if there's anything that you can do to impact and to make a difference is to actually be the leader that you want them to see in the world. I want to get your answer to, does this reflect your research, what Reshma was just talking about, but on a more personal level? You live a professional life. You have interesting goals and things that you want to do. But to say, OK, I'm going to step away from this and then get into politics. Politics is poison. Politics is <laughs> rotten. Politics is, you know, continue, adjective. It just, it's horrible. <laughs> what, no, why? Go for this it. Is, <laughs> no, it's. Why, that's a huge leap. Anything else, there's logic to, because there's financial, <laughs> no, there's financial remuneration, there's personal satisfaction, blah, 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 whatever. But to say, yeah. here's this other pool out there that really is fraught right. with danger and peril. Why make, why dive in? Because I don't consider myself to be a politician. I'm a change agent. And I think that we need to have another generation of, of, of political leaders who see themselves as change agents and not as politicians. And for me, I realized, you know, one, again, from my history, you know, I believe that, you know, those who drink from the well of American opportunity have the obligation to give it back. This country saved my parents' life. I'm going to fight every day to create opportunities for others. Secondly, with Girls Who Code, I learned that, you know, I could teach Julia how to code, but after eight weeks, I had to make sure that her father had a job that she had food on the table, that she was continuing to get 21st edu century education. And the only way that I could do that and fulfill my commitment to her was to be the next public advocate and make sure that we had actually created structures in place to do that. I also think for us, it's as women and as aspiring leaders, um, we just can't complain about the situation unless we're part of creating solutions. It's the solution-minded you know, politics that we need to, we need to generate. You know, Tiffany, I talk about this all the time. I mean, Structurally, in, in 1976, you know, 18% of women worked and had children. That number is 86% now. But because we don't have enough women in politics, there have been no structural changes. We still don't have paid parental leave, right? We still don't have affordable child care. We still haven't changed our zoning laws to make it possible to have daycare centers and buildings. There's so much work to be done. And by having more women in that space, we will do that work because we will take that on. But I, you know what? Just. I, I, I don't really even know your politics or anything else, but thanks for having the guts to do it. Absolutely. Just really, because that's, I think yeah. it's courageous. Well, and Harry, I think what, what Reshma is setting out to do is an emblematic of her generation. That's what we saw with all the leaders that we interviewed for our book. We saw these amazing young women and men that were stepping out and, and just trying to put themselves in there and not try to follow the traditional ways of doing things. Um, one of the young women that we interviewed for the book, and we interviewed people all over the world, but there was this um, woman in, in Japan named uh, Yamaguchi, Yamaguchi-san, and she's about, about you know, 24, 25 years old now, but when she was a child, she was bullied really badly in school, and her parents had to take her out. And um, as she told me this story, she, she wanted to get a fashion degree and started sketching, and she started became interested in handbags. She went on to Yahoo one day, she typed up what's the poorest country in Asia and discovered it was Bangladesh. And we obviously all know the, the tragedies that have happened in Bangladesh over the last 10 days. And what she did, though, is she went down and she went into a, um, into a, into a factory and she leased it. And the factory was all men. It was 110 men. And most of these men were illiterate and they were making sacks for grains and potatoes. And the first thing she did is she raised their salaries by 50%. So she's bootstrapping a business with no business, and she's telling these men, she's teaching these men who are twice her age esteem. The other thing she did, she gave them little um, name badges. They'd never had photos, most of them. 
And so they started to believe in themselves and she got samples and today she has seven stores in Tokyo and she pays double the average wages of labor in Bangladesh among these workers. But I think that's typical of the attitude that Rush was talking about. I think this is an absolutely new generation. It's a very solution focused generation and they're going at things in new ways. Is that, uh, that's such a dreamy, fabulous, uh, I hear a story like that, I was, sure. ooh, ooh, ooh. But, <laughs> No, but the, the real life is run by Wall Street. It's run by, you know, what is, what's your profit margin? What's your growth quarter to quarter? Sure. And if Apple can get away with having people at Foxconn be paid substandard wages and we're paying unphenomenal prices yeah. for stuff like this, yeah. where, where are the women in the, in, the, in the hierarchy of the company to say, you know what, or just people, thank you, yeah. to say, you know, maybe that's not the right thing to do. It's, yeah. it's, well, these values we see are driving innovation. So values around collaboration, about empathy, about um, focused on solutions are the things that are gonna be different. And, you know, it's not to say that, that what we discovered is a mainstream form of leadership, but it's an emergent form of leadership that's aligned around a far more collaborative world, a far more transparent world. And the other thing here we saw in our data was 72% of millennials would um, work for less money at a company whose values they believed in. Wow. So from a talent standpoint, mm. there's an implication there. Right. There's a ton of work to be done, but I think you need to equate you do traditionally feminine values that we talked about as people articulate them in the book with, with innovation and advantage, and that's what these people are doing. All right, just very quickly. Mothers. How important are mothers? It's Mother's Day, right? If this is gonna get done, how do, we, how do you spread your mother, your message as a mother around so that other mothers understand what the job is? Well, I'm really lucky because my life's work is advancing women and girls. And when I was growing up, my dad was a preacher. So I'm basically an evangelist. And I literally get to evangelize this message to mothers all you know, across the country. So, um, so that's really fortunate. But because of technology, there are ways that all of us can be our own preachers, right? You can blog, you can tweet, you can get your, your message out there. And I think it's really important, though, to also understand that in so many ways, we're all mothers. You know, I had this kind of disagreement with my neighbor the other day because my kids um, are required to call grownups by something in front of their name. So whether it's Mr. or Uncle. And so my kids said, you know, hi, Mr. Warren. And Mr. Warren went to go correct my kids and say, oh, no, 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 you don't need to call me Mr. Warren. I'm not that old. I'm just Warren. And my kids were kind of, you know, big eyed because they knew what they're supposed to do. And I had to kind of go up later and say, excuse me, Mr. Warren, but you're Mr. Warren for a reason. You know, these kids, I live in Harlem, you know, these kids that are out on the street at 10 o'clock at night and you're always thinking, like, where are their parents? Well, I don't want my kids to be those kids and I'm not gonna always be around you see me flying all over the place sending out my message doing what I'm supposed to do I need you to keep an eye on them and they have respect for you and part of that is calling you mr. Warren you're gonna be mr. Warren like you're a part of this village so um, he was like, don't you want I, come be my neighbor yeah yeah exactly so just you know keep that in mind we're talking about mothers but all of us have a responsibility when I was growing up my kids were foster my parents were foster parents to many many children and they really believe that children are everyone's responsibility and we all have a responsibility so we're all mothers and fathers and we all have a role to play give me a mom thought as we wrap real up. quick I mean when it comes to computer science education you're 70% more likely to take a CS course if your mother tells you to do it so moms are critical for us in our movement to teach a million girls how to code so please tell all your daughters to learn how to computer program and go out and buy John <laughs> John's book. Thank you all very much. Thank you.